There are some people out there who say that there's no such thing as a cute Klingon ship. To those people, I'd like to introduce you to the F-5. Not the fighter jet, not that one. What is it? It's a D-7, but schmoll. Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media, and today by the request of Commander Nathaniel Mead, I am taking a look at the Klingon F-5. Again, the Klingon F-5, not the F-5 fighter, although interestingly, I kind of see them as quite similar. Both kind of sort of forgotten craft. So we'll go into it and perhaps uh, illuminate you a little bit more on the Klingon F-5 frigate. So the Klingon F-5 is actually a design from Starfleet Battles, not faster, and that's very interesting because Starfleet Battles has a bit of a different approach to design and, and style. Um, they basically just stick to the TOS aesthetic. FASA is much more sort of rooted in that motion picture era. That does kind of limit it in some respects. You'll see very awkward designs like the um, like the Klingon B-10, which still uses it, which is this huge Klingon battleship, but it still uses tiny little uh, D-7 nacelles as does the F-5, but the F-5 being a little frigate fits a lot, lot better. And generally, it just fits in very nicely into this era, whilst also being very nice and distinctive. This 3D model that you'll be seeing was built by Adam Turner, linked to his DeviantArt page in the description. So, without any further ado, let's get into the story of the F-5. So it was built in 2257, just one year after the D7. Now, that's partially a testament to, well, it's a small frigate, it's very quick and easy to build, but it's also a testament to the new Klingon style of logistics, in which all the ships of this period, of the sort of original series era, they're all using the same interchangeable parts. And that is what makes construction so rapid, is that these ships can be built very, very quickly, sharing most of their parts with one another. And that also makes long-term logistics also much easier. Each ship is just using different variants of the same parts. Now, it's not entirely D7 parts. You'll notice that the head section is actually a distinct part. And, of course, the uh, main body section is, again, a distinct part. But the, the nacelles and the dorsal aft module all are in common with the D7. So you can see there immediately that they're doing as much as they can to simplify logistics. It also serves as a good sort of turn means of turnover and uh, familiarization for crews. So if you are having a rapid turnover of crew, because it's, you know, wartime or whatever, people are being shifted about, you're bringing new people on. Flying an F5 and flying a D7, and in terms of how the bridges are designed and how the consoles will be done, they'll be exactly the same. So it won't feel really that different either. Just because someone's trained on an F5 doesn't mean that they then can't also go off and fly a D7. What this really speaks to is the Klingon's incredible production capacity. Obviously, you have all the shipyards of the great houses, and once brought under the power of the state uh, during this time, it gave the Klingons an incredible production capacity, but as I say, tie that together with effective logistics. During the Four Years' War, they had a real problem of... They had a lot of different models of ships, and sometimes just different variations of the same ship. But it was enough that logistics became incredibly strained because they had to have all these parallel logistics strains for sometimes different versions of the same ship, like the, like the D4. There were at least two versions of the D4 in service with their yeah, tiny variations, but enough variation and enough specialist separate parts that it was a problem. That was a problem that you really got from the Four Years' War. And the goal of the Klingon Empire in the years following that has been to simplify and make a more efficient logistics train that could produce starships and supply large numbers of starships in the field very effectively and that's why all the ships of this era look very much alike. Now in terms of the role of the F5 it's much more fair to compare the F5 to its predecessors and actually 
it's got a bit of DNA from two main sources. It's got a little bit of raptor in it, and it's also got a lot of DNA from the bird of prey gunship. There's two real things that the F5 is capable of doing, and that is sort of general purpose frigate duty, and the other is exploitation. For a ship of its size, the F5 is quite well built, and it's built with a decent amount of supplies and reserves, and that is because it is intended for exploitation. And these are the ships that are going to go through the enemy lines and wreak havoc on enemy shipping, enemy logistics, do all that damage. And so for the F5, it kind of sits in the middle of what is effectively the medium force. You have the heavy breakthrough force in which you have the D7 and stuff like that. And then you have the skirmish force, which includes things like the uh, Defender. The exploitation force in terms of its tonnage and sort of firepower sits sort of in the middle. So it's the medium force and the F5 is the medium ship of the medium force. You may say that that makes it quite a mediocre ship, but that's actually very much misunderstanding its role. As I say, the F5 is, is comfortable carrying out a variety of missions from uh, reconnaissance. Heavy skirmish, you know, once you're starting to get an F5 involved, that's a pretty hefty skirmish. The F5 is fairly versatile, can engage smaller, more mobile targets, but it can also muck in and help out in those larger engagements. It isn't going to be completely out of place engaging a constitution, or certainly not if it's um, in formation with other F5s or supporting a D9. Now, in terms of its size, as I say, it uses some D7 parts, but then other sort of scaled-down, tailor-made parts. They'll still be very familiar to any Klingon crew. The F5 is 134 meters long, 125 meters wide, with a draft of 43 meters, depends on how pernickety you want to be. So it's it's small, but actually in this era, it's not tiny. And it's well built. This is a thing that you'll really come to see comparing. They were a lot more uh, flimsy and and uh, haphazardly constructed. You know, using all those all those struts and fairings to reinforce the structure. F5, much like its larger brother, the D7, is very cleanly built. Now, in terms of its weaponry, what we have here is pretty simple armament, but good general purpose armament. This is really where you see that uh, early bird of prey DNA at play here, because you have uh, two heavy disruptor cannons in the wings, five light disruptors. You have two four under the uh, chin, and then three aft on the dorsal aft module. And then you have one torpedo launcher, where the torpedo launcher is always kept. That can also be swapped out on certain models for a sensor dish instead. Most F5s in a squadron will mount the torpedo launcher, but there will be perhaps one that will mount the uh, sensor dish, and that will serve as the, the recon vessel in that formation. What we really see here is a very strong hit-and-run design. This is not hit-and-run as in hit and retreat, which is sometimes how hit and run is characterized. To do hit and retreat, you actually have to be very, very fast. If you're running up to a target, hitting it, and then you turning, well, that gives your target more time to catch up to you. You've about probably about half the range each time. So instead, the F5 is designed to overshoot because that creates the most uh, distance. If you engage, fire all your weapons, fire your aft weapons and overshoot. In the time that it will take for your enemy to perform their U-turn to bring their prow weapons into arc, the distance between you has doubled. Obviously, this only really works on very isolated ships, not necessarily if you're going up against a full battle line, but because this is an exploitation vessel, it's not actually anticipating coming up against much of an enemy force. It's anticipating coming up against stragglers, against single starships or small groups. And for that kind of work, the F5 is perfect. They'll operate in pairs, in, do, in those are the smallest you'll see them. More commonly, the, there'll be a squadron of four, and that will be the main sort of element of them. And they will, again, be in support of the K7, which is much lighter, but very, very fast, or the D9. Bit larger, bit heavier, but effectively the F5 is there serving as support to both the lighter vessel and the heavier vessel. That's really where being a medium comes in, is being able to 
help out in whichever engagement requires it. So after entering service in 2257, they would operate for 10 years until the Treaty of Organia, basically freely in the Klingon Federation borderland area. There's this area of space between the Klingon Empire and the Federation, which both exert claims to, but both can't fully control or police effectively. And this is where all these skirmishes between Federation and Klingon ships mostly take place. And in this time, the F-5 would run amok in the borderland. It was perfect. If you saw a merchantman that you fancied his uh, cargo, you flew over in your F-5 and you took it. There was very little out there apart from, you know, seriously armed vessels that the F-5 couldn't handle. It was also quick enough that it could catch pretty much anything it wanted. And even when you're confronted with a larger vessel like, say, a Constitution-class heavy cruiser, okay, individually doesn't sound much of a chance, but put four of them, put a full wolf pack of F-5s out there and send them at a Constitution, and this is a situation that would regularly happen. A squadron of F-5s would see a Federation heavy cruiser and say, right, let's go mess with him. And they would charge, headlong, warp speed charge, right at the Federation ship in hopes of forcing him to, you know, break off, basically playing a warp speed game of chicken. That was a very regular occurrence. So during that period, the F-5 really just ran amok and was, was the most feared Klingon ship? No, it would ultimately fall back if confronted with a superior force. It wasn't like a D-7 which might actually take on a fight even against a superior foe. F-5 crews were trained to, you know, take opportunities where they could, but not to be too greedy and not to get in over their heads. And in terms of the Starfleet reaction, they, they class the F-5 as a scout. Starfleet definitions of Klingon ships are very limited. I think the best description is that it is a medium. That's my best description. It's a medium and I would say it fits the bill of a frigate very, very well. You know, again, it's carrying over the the DNA of the bird of prey from the 22nd century, which was ultimately a heavy frigate, and also taking in some light cruiser DNA, mostly just by sheer proximity to the fact that it's using a lot of the same parts as the D7. It's using the same parts as the D7. It's, of course, got some cruiser DNA in there, mostly in terms of its range and, and, and operational mobility. So it remained in service until 2282 when it was replaced by the Burrell Bird of Prey. So it only saw 25 years in service. There can be arguments made about, oh, should they have replaced it? You know, couldn't they have just refitted it like a Katinga? And yes, to an extent they could and they did. But the problem you ultimately faced is that when the Bird of Prey entered the equation, when the Burrell entered the equation, things changed and, and expectations and operational requirements changed and ultimately the F-5 was not up to the rigours of what was going to be needed in that later period of the 23rd century. It wasn't going to be satisfactory to military requirements. Very, very heavy emphasis on breakthrough, on the battle cruisers, and largely, yeah, the, the idea of, of exploitation became less and less of a, of a concept. As the size and scope of enemy fleets grew, and as the scale and effectiveness of enemy defences and fortifications improved, suddenly having all these ships set aside for exploitation, when actually you're going to be running into more ships and more fortifications, having a ship like the F-5 didn't really make much sense. It's not going to really be able to do all that much. So instead, it was replaced by the Bird of Prey. And really, while that is sad, only 25 years of service, which is very, you know, very short for a Klingon ship, like most ships of this era, it fell victim to what was a relentless arms race. New technology rendered it obsolete. And what it ultimately came down to was the Burrell could do its job well enough, as well as many other jobs. And so, unfortunately, the poor thing couldn't really make an argument for itself and, you know, ultimately lost out to the Burrell Bird of Prey, as did many other ships. 
but that's just how technology works. So it's very sad to see, but at least it was important in its day and still serves as a very interesting demonstration of how the Klingons operated in the middle part of the 23rd century. And I hope you all have a new appreciation of this cute little Klingon uh, ship. Don't turn it into a waifu. Do not do that. Do not dare. I do not want to see that on, on the internet. I do not want to see that on DeviantArt or Reddit. Don't, don't you dare. Don't do it. No. Bad. Thank you guys for watching. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. And I will see you all in the next video.